Sniper Wolf is a great example of someone who managed to use their unique position of being a girl gamer in the early 2010s, turning it into a thriving YouTube career with millions upon millions of followers, brand deals, and even receiving the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Award for Best Gamer in 2019 and 2020. But what if I told you that all of this was a lie? Or, you know, allegedly. The Sniper Wolf channel has been active since 2013, with new accusations of the gameplay being faked, surfacing basically every single day, both from the average commenter and even large personalities within the content world. But these were nothing more than unproven rumors, as what went on behind the scenes of the channel was a well-kept secret until today. You know, allegedly. In new court documents, Sniperwolf is currently being sued by her now estranged husband, this guy, also known as Sausage, who in this very lawsuit claims that he approached Sniperwolf in 2013 with an offer of him playing games such as Call of Duty or Metal Gear Rising Revengeance while recording his gameplay, with him then preparing a script for each of the recordings that Sniperwolf would read on camera and then act as if she was playing the video game in the footage herself. And honestly, you could see why people would think that. While Sniperwolf herself was the face of the channel, you know, she was in every thumbnail and of course all over the gameplay, the husband was heavily involved in the creative process behind the scenes of the channel, working on things such as content origination and development, script writing, directing, video editing, posting videos to the channel, market research and analysis, among other things. So basically, Sausage was the brains behind the operation. And while most viewers might know of Sniperwolf for her insanely high effort non-gaming content, the picture. <laughs> During the pivotal years and most of the years of her career, she, allegedly, had her rise to fame by having her at the time boyfriend Sausage play the game in the background, with her simply acting as if she was the one playing the game all along. Over the next 10 years, rapidly making the rise to the 33 million subscriber mark by today and even receiving the Nickelodeon Kids Choice Award for Best Gamer not only in 2019 but in the following year as well. The two would separate in September 2022 and due to the way the channel was set up, with the two sharing all profits 50-50, Sniperwolf wanted to get out of paying her ex any more money for her business that she had to, allegedly starting to conspire with the G Fuel brand manager to create brand deals going over her ex-husband's head with him seeing none of the money, as well as creating several new channels in different languages to receive ad revenue without any of the proceeds going to him. At the time of the court filing, these additional channels alone had accumulated over a hundred million views and accrued over 1.2 million dollars in estimated revenue. And by getting screwed over by this ongoing divorce, making this a legal matter, which means everything is brought to light during a beautiful process called discovery, Sausage ended up revealing the secret of the Sniper Wolf channel. You could say how the sausage is made and that it wasn't her playing and instead it was a guy pretending to be a girl with the girl in question also pretending all for internet clout. And you know, millions and millions of dollars as well. In addition to that, when looking at the publicly available stats, you can see how Sniperwolf's monthly video views have dropped by half ever since the two broke up, showing that Sausage may have had a massive role in the success of her channel. It's easy to see how combining the best of all worlds, the unique position of being a girl gamer in the early days of gaming, who's apparently good at games, with marketable, you know, good looks and, you know, personality or lack thereof, would be considered a profitable venture. As due to how few opportunities women get in the competitive space or gaming in general, we just don't see that many female gamers in the top ranks or even in the top competitive teams. Which is why Ellie blew the competitive Overwatch scene wide open. Ellie was the online persona of a 17-year-old girl who was fabled to be one of the best Overwatch players, let alone female Overwatch players, in the world, who, after just a few months of creating her Battle.net and Twitter account, would end up climbing ranked all the way to the fourth place in the top 500 on December 17th, 2018, marking her quick rise as one of the, at the time, young esports scene's biggest prodigies. While Ellie didn't really stream or make content by herself, due to the high rating of her account, she would usually appear in other Twitch streamers' games, where she would end up identifying herself as a woman in the voice chat. Eager to capitalize on this budding talent, knowing the marketability of a female rising star in esports, the organization Second Wind did not hold back in bringing her onto the team, 
signing Ellie as one of the DPS players for their contenders team as soon as on December 21st, so just a few days after she had ranked 4, and making her the first female player to compete in the North American contenders. The announcement looked strange, and that's not because she was a female player, but esports roster announcement graphics normally look something like this, with a big welcome to the player, maybe a picture and their real name underneath. But for Ellie, Second Win only disclosed her gamer tag, nothing else. In addition to the Second Win manager ending up in the competitive Overwatch subreddit and stating that she has a rather flexible hero pool, has the raw ranked Q stats that fit our scouting requirements, and has played with our players before, which gives them some synergy. Following the announcement, several players started questioning whether her skill or even her identity was real and wondering about the seemingly very hasty decision by Second Win to sign a completely unknown player to a team competing at this high of a level. Following all of these doubts and speculation, Ellie would end up tweeting a leaked Discord conversation where a contenders player was calling for doxing just to reveal her real identity in these messages implying that despite not revealing her real name due to how the tournament is set up, where you have to give your real life information to actually sign up and play, meaning that somebody in the contenders league staff must know her real identity. Not getting the results that they were looking for, the Overwatch community remained suspicious about Ellie to the point where she felt forced to do a live stream on December 28th just to dispel any rumors surrounding her identity. And while these past broadcasts now are lost to time, many Reddit commenters felt her performance during the stream was lacking, with the Twitch streamer Dafren going as far as to speculate that the person playing on the Ellie account wasn't the same person who was in the voice chat. And in a twist of fate, on January 2nd, Second Win announced that Ellie made a decision to step down from the team due to some unforeseen reactions, with a flurry of tweets from the Second Win manager accusing the Overwatch community of being unable to view a player as a player. The entire event sparked outrage in the community, with several esports and gaming outlets, and even some mainstream outlets as well, covering the story of how this poor female player was getting bullied out of the esports scene, with nobody trusting her legitimacy because of, you know, sexism or something. The competitive Overwatch community was set ablaze. But all while the presses were printing and Twitter doing what Twitter does best, you know, entering a flame war, something else was going on beneath the surface. And on January 4th, two days after Ellie stepped down, Twitch streamer Aspen revealed that the person playing on the Ellie account was in fact a top 500 ranked player by the name of Punisher, and this was later corroborated in a series of tweets by the notable Overwatch figure, Slasher. In this same thread, Slasher shared light on the identity of Punisher, who apparently initially had used the Ellie account just to grieve Overwatch League and top players' games. In fact, leading up to all of these events, Punisher had approached several women that he met in-game and asked them to get on the mic and pretend to be the female persona that he claimed to be. On the same day, Koluge, who had been released from the second win roster some days prior to Ellie joining the team, also claimed to have been one of the people playing on the Ellie account. With all of these news coming to light, the second win management was in shambles and released a statement that they were unaware that the person playing on the account wasn't who they claimed to be. Eventually, Punisher himself came forward and confirmed that the Ellie persona was fake, that all of the doubts were valid, and that he had gone through all of this trouble for what he called a social experience. Experiment. Now, whether this was supposed to be a social experiment or not, we will never really know, but if you thought that the amount of coverage Ellie was getting when she was the victim of this huge, sexist esports conglomerate, wait until what happened after the truth came out. Because things went nuclear. Some outlets backtracked and changed up their articles or posted new ones just to correct the mistake, and some other outlets, such as Kotaku, stuck to their guns and explained how this whole ordeal shows how toxic the esports scene is towards women, with YouTuber PewDiePie due to personal drama, reveling in Kotaku making a mistake. Kotaku did an oopsie. All while explaining the situation in this video, with countless of other creators obviously following suit. The Ellie situation is a good example of what happens if you act on something that just seems too good to be true without actually verifying it, and that once things start getting a little too much attention, the truth will inevitably come to light. And this story always seems to come back in one way, shape, or form. And while this next story does draw a lot of similarities, the story of Rayfella took it to the next level. Back in the early days of Apex, what was considered a professional player was a lot different than it is today. There weren't really any custom lobbies or private tournaments, meaning that all of the competition that took place were in the form of kill races meaning that you would queue into a game and try to kill as many enemies as possible before the game was over. With that in mind, Rayfella was a 16-year-old female professional player playing under Team Synergy, which is more known as a trickshotting clan. 
She was on Team Synergy alongside Slurp and Nags, two players who would move from console and become established pros later down the line. At a point in time during these earlier days of the game, she had the world record for the most damage in one game, as well as being tied with the highest amount of kills in one game alongside Mendo, and to many, she was considered the best female player in Apex. With the skills came the brawn. Rayfella was known to have somewhat of an ego, even going as far as to falsely claiming that she was the first female player to reach the highest rank of Apex Predator, when somebody else already had beaten her to the punch. It's worth noting that while she did stream, most of her online presence, especially her kill records and high kill games, was solely known through Twitter. Players eventually started to take notice that she never really posted the VODs of these high kill games, only in some cases the scores, which is really strange. As most people might know, posting a high kill game, especially around that time, especially when you get a world record, would net in an insane amount of views and exposure to your name. After all, Mendo, who she shared a kill record with, used this world record to launch an entire streaming career. This, when combined with the fact that Rayfella apparently was mute, was a large part as to why the community started suspecting that maybe Rayfella wasn't who she really claimed to be. But many didn't want to call her out, as she said she was just a 16-year-old girl who just wanted to help out her parents, ending up starting a fundraiser and stating that her mother had gotten very sick. This fundraiser ended up raising a lot of money for her parents, with notable Apex personalities chiming in with a good amount of money. A few weeks after the fundraiser, Rayfella announced that she had been the first female console player to be signed to a professional organization, that being Rogue. But as soon as Rogue announced the signing, all hell broke loose. With the announcement, some players managed to track down Rayfella's real Facebook profile, only to learn who she really was. Instead of being a 16-year-old mute girl, Rayfella was a 22-year-old woman who was very capable of speaking. The same users also found out that the picture that she used for her Twitter account actually had been uploaded to her Facebook page seven years ago. When confronted with the evidence, instead of denying or trying to explain the evidence, she ended up getting mad at the person who exposed her, claiming that she was only exposed because this person hated her, and that she put in the work and deserved to be signed. And you could argue she was right if it wasn't for the fact that she had pretended to be a 16-year-old girl just to raise money for her parents, and some speculate that she pretended to be a 16-year-old girl to get people off of her back once Manny started getting suspicious of her skills. Because with high kill games come cheating allegations, especially if it is someone who came out of nowhere, like Rafaela, and especially, sadly, as we've seen in this video, whenever a female player is doing well. And once the floodgates had opened, there was no stopping what was to come next. The Apex community had lost all trust for Rayfella and no longer believed that she even was the player who got all of the kill records in the first place, or even played the game herself, because how would they know? She was supposedly mute and wouldn't be able to speak as she streamed or even played the game. Many from the Apex community suspected that it wasn't actually Rayfella playing the game, but her boyfriend doing so instead. The father of her daughter, and yeah, she even had a kid, actually was a booster, which is a player who levels up or ranks up other players' accounts for money, who had been very active on socials trying to get her name out there. And after all of this got out, only four hours after signing Rayfella, Rogue ended up dropping her from the organization with more evidence of her boyfriend playing instead of her ended up surfacing as well. And unlike the two other stories in this video, you might have noticed there isn't really that much proof to back up the story in this video, and that's because all of the pieces of evidence never have and probably never will see the light of day. But you can best believe that the sources for the Rayfella story are all reputable, and just like the other players in this video, no matter how much you avoid the truth, it will always come out. Speaking of which, this really reminds me of Facilitator, who was the number one Apex Predator who hid his cheats for so many years before finally getting caught. So if you want to learn more about his story, check out the video on the screen. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Peace out.